Hello everyone and welcome to a new series of short videos here on the Natural History Society of Northumbria's YouTube channel. I'm James Common, Senior Naturalist with NHSN and in these short videos we'll be taking a quick look at some specific groups of plants you could find with relative ease across the northeast. We'll take a look at the common species you're likely to spot in your neck of the woods, explore some rarer ones and I hope learn a little about identifying the ones you're likely to encounter out there in the countryside. Kicking us off this time around, I thought we would look at a really familiar group of plants, clovers, the kind you see on your road verges lawns right across the region. Let's get started. So what exactly are clovers? Well, they're some of our best known wildflowers. And the chances are by walking just a few meters from your front door, you'll find at least one growing on a grassy corner somewhere. What are they exactly? Well, they are members of the pea family, Fabaceae, as told by their modified five petaled flowers as seen on the lovely little diagram here. You'll see the longer petal here, the banner familiar from your garden sweet peas or perhaps the peas you grow to eat. What sets clovers apart from other members of the pea family, however, is the arrangement of the flowers themselves. Um, they're modified into a tight clustered head. Anyone who's seen red clover or white clover perhaps on your garden lawn will recognise these instantaneously. And of course, they also have trifoliate leaves, leaves in sets of three unless, of course, you're lucky enough to find a four-leaf clover. By large, this group of plants is found in grassy habitats, anywhere from city lawns to coastal grasslands. And while many are familiar to us, there are also some rarer ones out there. They're fairly diverse, actually, the clovers. We'll look at about nine today, but if you could encounter many more. So first up, one of the two clovers so many of us know and love, and the one which perhaps we'll spot on a daily basis wherever we are in the region. This is white clover, Trifolium repens, and it is a prolific plant found in a whole manner of grassy habitats, easily recognised by its white flowers and its rather low-lying flat habit. Repens, part of the Latin name of the species, means flat or low-lying, and whenever you see this, you will really notice it's sprawling across lawns, perhaps path sides, or within agricultural fields. The leaves of white clover are fairly distinctive. They're chubby, you'll notice they're rounded in outline, and they also have this wonderful pale marking streaked across the middle here. This, alongside the white flowers, we often see as a great way of telling this plant apart from the rest. One of the only things that can be slightly confusing about white clover is that the flowers can often be a little two-toned in nature. They can be white and pink. Um, you'll soon see that there is another far scarcer clover out there which has this. But by and large, look at the leaves. If they're rounded, have a pale marking. And if the whole plant is flat to the floor, you most likely have white clover. Our second clover now, another one we'll see fairly regularly wherever we are in the northeast, um, and thankfully one which is quite a bit different to the last. This is red clover, um, a taller plant than white clover, which grows upright as opposed to creeping. By doing this, it can often form quite a tall plant among rank vegetation. So you'll often see it up there competing with taller grasses and um, rough herbs in sort of ranker habitats. Different to the last, it also has narrow, rather elongate leaves as opposed to the chubby round ones of white clover. Um, and of course, it still has a pale marking on the center of the leaves, but if you look at the outline, it is fairly different. One of the nice things about red clover is its large pink flowers. Pink clover might have been a more suitable name for, as you'll see a bit later on, there is actually a clover out there which is far redder in colour. But with pink flowers, a tall habit um, and long leaves, you, can't be fair, you can be fairly certain you have red clover. But if you want to be extra sure, you can check the stipule. What's one of these, you ask? Here on the right, you see the typical stipule of red clover. For 
a little background, a stipule is simply a small leafy appendage that sits at the base of the leaf stalk where it joins the main stem. As you'll see here, red clover, um, it, this is pointed and tapers to a long bristle-like tip. Hopefully you can see that on the image here. Um, a key factor when separating this from another pesky species you'll see soon. Unlike some other clovers, the stipule is also rather wide and membranous. It almost looks translucent at first glance, um, but it is definitely not green as it is in so many different clovers. But that's enough on stipules for now. I think you'll hear this term quite a bit throughout this short talk. Now, just using South Northumberland as an example here, I've added this in just to demonstrate just how common the two species we've mentioned so far are. They are very abundant indeed. Um, the two you are most likely to spot wherever you go in the area. Perhaps you can even fill in some of these gaps from my record here. An interesting one now, and the first non-native clover on our list. This lovely two-tonal plant is Alsike clover, an introduction from Europe thought to have cropped up here as a result of grass seed as a contaminant among seed collected on the continent. It isn't all that common in our area, but it can pop up anywhere, particularly on roadsides and in recently sown grasslands and lawns. You may be able to tell from the picture here, but this is another upright clover, similar in habit to red clover. It doesn't creep like your white clover from earlier. Rather nicely, it also has really clear two tonal flowers, pink and white, as you'll hopefully see here. Looking at the leaves of all side clover, you'll also notice that they are longer than the pudgy round ones of white clover and almost always lack that pale marking. Um, a good way of separating the two if ever you find yourself a little bit confused. An interesting, slightly anecdotal observation on this one is that while you can find it, it can be really numerous at particular sites. It is often short-lived, temporary, ephemeral. Um, you might get really big populations all of a sudden on a new verge, and then they'll almost disappear entirely within a few years. And here we have just a closer look at some specific parts of Alsike clover. You'll notice the upright habit here. It's a very bushy, tall plant. And of course, looking at the stipule, um, we looked at red clover before, which was membranous and tapered to a long point. Well, rather nicely, this one is green. Now, this is where things get a little bit interesting and it becomes necessary to sort of compare and contrast your plants a little bit. This rather beautiful one here, one of my favorites, is zigzag clover, trifolium medium. A plant of typically wilder, grassy areas. Um, you're less likely to see this on a roadside verge or rough patch, but it is possible. Um, the biggest populations I know of are certainly on rather well-managed nature reserves on the coast. And you'll be forgiven for looking at these pictures and thinking it looks an awful lot like red clover. Um, but just thinking in the grand scheme of things, this one is far less abundant. And you could always assume, at least at first, that you're looking at red clover before trying to prove yourself wrong. At first glance, this has the same rather large pink flowers and elongate leaves of red clover, but there are specific differences. Zigzag clover um, has a very clear section of stem here beneath the flower head before the first section of leaves, which is absent in red clover. But the really key difference in this plant is the stipule. And we'll take another look at that now. So here again on the left, you see the long pointed membranous stipule of red clover. And here you see this one of zigzag clover. You'll notice it is green, um, quite a stark difference in color there. But more importantly, it doesn't taper to a bristle-like tip. Um, it's rather more triangular in appearance. Um, the textbooks will tell you it is an isosceles triangle, but if you're like me and cannot remember your GCSE maths lessons, I think triangular is more than enough. And I think you'll be pleased to know this is the last mention of stipules in this talk. 
And again, here we just have two maps, those for Alsike clover and zigzag clover. Um, again, using South Northumberland as a sort of reference here. You notice they are rather scarce, but don't let the maps fool you. I suspect if you get out there looking, you'll probably find it at many more sites. Now we've dealt with those four, we start getting into the more elusive clovers, the ones which make you smile or perhaps do a very excited botanical dance whenever you see them. And first up, a really nice one, we have the unmistakable hare's foot clover, a rather curious, weird looking plant of dry, sandy areas in our region. You're most likely to spot this one on the coast or in upland areas, but strange things do happen. Just last week, I was out with a group of NHSN members and somebody actually found us on a building site in urban Newcastle um, where buildings had been demolished. So if you think um, dry, sandy, rubbly habitat, much like you would see on a rocky coastline. This clover is rather nice to tell apart from the pack. It doesn't take too much effort in summer. Just look out for these wonderful fluffy flower heads you see here. If you want to be more specific, you can look for distinctively narrow leaves showing on the middle image here. And of course, give the plant a feel. You should notice that the whole thing is softly downy. An added feature of this plant is it can form really dense clumps and it isn't as reaching, it isn't as upward as many of the other clovers. It's quite a bushy plant. Now, I mentioned a redder clover earlier. Well, here you have it, um, crimson clover, trifolium in Canon. Native to Europe, this is another introduced species in the Northeast. Um, it was brought across, I believe, as a fodder crop for livestock but it may also be used as a nitrogen fixer in places to prepare farmland for crops. It does, however, escape from time to time when it is introduced, um, and more so in recent years, it is actually cropping up as a component of spilt bird seed. Therefore, you might find it, for example, in pavements and urban areas where someone has been feeding their local house sparrows. Crimson clover is unmistakable um, and not much needs to be said about it. Just look out for these wonderful, tall, bright red flowers. And of course, an upright habit and broad leaves. Um, important to note that these leaflets actually overlap. It may not be too visible on the central image here, but they are quite clearly overlapping when you take a closer look. You're not too likely to see this one, but it is frequently sown in our area. So if you were to creep around the margins of an agricultural field, you might just find one which has popped the fence and is growing on a rough margin somewhere. Now we're starting to get into the quite specialist plants here, but the ones which really are worth recording whenever you find them. This is our first real specialist on this list. And perhaps the most underwhelming, if like me, you got very excited to see it and then realized it was actually quite a uninspiring thing. So yes, this small, rather inconspicuous plant is rough clover, Trifolium scabrum, a rare species of sandy soils on the coast. It isn't all that impressive, but I confess. And when I say this plant is small, I really mean it. It rarely grows above 20 centimetres, but in reality, it's likely to be much smaller than that. And is most often seen pressed flat on the ground in a similar manner to white clover, but even more minute. The flowers of rough clover are small, white and somewhat spiny looking, owing to the pointed calyx lobes you see jutting out from the flower head here. These give it a really distinctive, almost hedgehog-like look, even when in fruit. So here, yes, you'll see the leaves of rough clover here to the left. These are softly downy to the touch, but perhaps a little bit more interesting, have some fairly unique looking veins on the leaves. You'll see here that they are thickening towards the outside of the leaf and curving a little bit downwards. They're almost invisible as you head towards the central part of the leaf. This is a really unique feature of this little plant. 
You'll also see here those spiny flower heads I mentioned with these really pointed calyx lobes, giving it a really almost fawny, bird-like appearance. This, coupled with these lovely little leaves here, are quite indicative of rough clover. Knotted clover now, Trifolium striatum, um, perhaps somewhat similar to the last one we saw, but not horribly so. A plant of open sandy areas. This is another tiny low-growing species with softly hairy stems and leaves. The difference here, rather nicely, is that the flowers are pink, unlike the white ones of rough clover we just saw. And as you'll see, they're also lacking those really long jutting out lobes we discussed. One of the nice features of knotted clover is actually the fruiting heads. Once it is flowered, the calyx swells to form a cluster of barrel-shaped fruit, fruits, which rather nicely display these lovely little red stripes down their length, a little like a pinstripe suit or pinstripe pyjamas. I don't know if anybody wears them anymore. I think I've got a pair in the cupboard. Um, this is a unique feature of this clover. So really, if you find a tiny pressed to the ground pink flowering clover, which if you catch it in fruit, has these lovely little stripy barrels here, you've got knotted clover. Finishing up with something a little more exciting now, and one which, if you find it, you really should get excited about. Um, this is strawberry clover, and you'll see why it is named such quite soon. Now, it's important to note that this one hasn't been spotted locally since the 1990s, um, at least in Northumberland. I'm not entirely sure what the state of this plant is in County Durham. But regardless of this, Sightings from elsewhere in the country have shown it can turn up as a casual colonist of a whole manner of habitats on disturbed ground, for example. Strawberry clover is rather unique and distinctive, but not for its flowers. These, as you'll see here, are rather generic and pink. They're not too similar to red clover. They're noticeably smaller in size, but they have that same clover-like look to them. What sets this clover apart from the others is actually the seed heads here, which you will see once they swell towards the end of the flowering season, look an awful lot like a strawberry. But if you don't catch it in fruit, otherwise you're looking for pink flower heads that are smaller. Um, that combined with a habit which is slightly more reminiscent of white clover, pressed to the floor, low growing, should give you a good idea that you've got strawberry clover. It's unlikely you encounter this one, but if you do, I think I speak for all botanists when we say we'd love to hear about it. Yes, and this is just a closer look here at those lovely fruiting bodies of strawberry clover I mentioned previously. They do look almost edible, don't they? And that concludes our little whistle stop tour of the common and some scarce clovers you could find across our region. There are, of course, several more out there. Two of these actually are shown here, both sort of creamy yellow in appearance, um, Hungarian clover and sulfa clover. Both are horribly rare in our area and are more likely to turn up as introductions or cas casuals. Um, but hopefully they give a flavour that the clover group is actually far broader than some of us might think at first. If you spatch spot one which doesn't match the descriptions given so far, you could just have something a little special. Most of the time though, you will have the ones we've discussed and if you're keen to get your eye in, it pays to start looking for them. So with that, thank you for watching. We'll be recording more of these short videos over the weeks and months ahead and if there are any plant groups you would like to see covered, we'd absolutely love to hear from you. We're open to ideas, as long as it's not dandelions or brambles or any with sort of 300 contained under that umbrella. Until then, goodbye. Thank you.